pattern glass in Iowa has a really, really brief, short history, almost as short as this program will be tonight. Um, <laughs> all of a whole maybe 15, 18 months in total. Yeah, so it's very, very brief. And as to how glass industry came to Iowa, it's many different stories. But um, the Philadelphia Exposition of 1876 was one of the primary forces behind pressed glass, mass-produced pressed glass taking on in the United States. And all the major glass houses exhibited there at that exposition. And also moving westward as to how to promote industry, they were looking westward. And the Iowa City Glass Company, as nearly as anybody can figure out, was founded by J. Elch Layton. Um, he is thought to be one of six children of Thomas Layton. And Thomas Layton has a pretty solid past in American glass industry. And that's because he invented the potion, so we'll say, um, recipe to make ruby glass, which in the United States, that held a lot to do with railroad lenses, pharmacy. And until then, we just had brown and green and very crude glass. And also, he worked for Wheeling and Hobbs Bachner. Um, glass company, um, both really eminent glass manufacturers of the late and mid-Victorian era. And while he was at Hobbs Bachner, he invented what is called uh, Findlay Onyx. And it's a type of glass that is made, comprised of three different layers. And it was only made for maybe three to nine months. And this was a layer of two layers of glass, and then they, a layer of blown glass in between a third layer of glass. And due to the annealing and cooling process, nearly 98% of the production failed. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and by um, um, uh, glass collectors was called, they nicknamed it suicide glass. Because it could even make it into the stores and it would explode and break. <laughs> and Findlay Onyx is probably one of the most expensive American Victorian art glasses you could buy today. It brings thousands of dollars, even damaged. What? It's called Findlay Onyx. It's not terribly attractive. It is a yellowish milk glass with patterns on it. Um, very, very rare. I've seen two pieces ever. Um, but the Leighton family in the glass, early glass industry in the United States, and all six of his children, his boys, sons, were glass blowers. And J.H. Leighton, he is the one who decided to come west and he originally came to Kyoto, Iowa. And um, I believe that was around 1879, 1878, somewhere in there. And he'd come out here and decided that the Iowa River, the sand was good enough to make glass in. So he came to Kyoto and he brought some workers with him to Kyoto. And he only set up production there for very, very few months. And it seemed that commerce was going to be more, the Iowa City was the place to be. The railroad was going through Iowa City. They were going to bring uh, boats up, paddle boats up the Iowa River, and it was just going to, you know, boom. So he decided, okay, he would go to Iowa City. And he'd made friends with about 10 influential people, maybe more investors. And so he had backing, $40,000 to start this glass factory in Iowa City in 1879, 1880, about that. And they were incorporated in uh, April 30th of 1880, which is the Iowa City Flint Glass Manufacturing. And li it listed J.H. Layton as 
an uh, owner and operator. And he brought from him, with him, from Ohio, molds and other men to help run this experienced glass blowers and in car wood carvers to carve the wooden molds and stuff. And so they, um, in Iowa City, they came upon a location in Iowa City, um, which is at Kirkwood and Maiden Lane in Iowa City. And if you know Iowa City at all, that is um, just south of downtown and just east of the Iowa River. Um, there's, I believe, something to do with the university, maybe a student union or some type of building there, student services building, and a gas station. And that gas station has actually been there since the 1950s. And in the 1950s, uh, why are we not going the wrong way? I'll get up here. In the 1950s, Back. They were building this gas station there on the site, and some interested parties in Iowa City Glass, uh, particularly um, uh, the Abbotts. He was a, a doctor in Iowa City, and the Reverend Arthur Flippinger, his wife and his daughter went down. And they spent several weekends going through the site where they were going to build this gas station. You see the tanks in the background. And this was in the early 50s. And they came up with these shards of glass and marbles. And this is where they really decided to, were able to identify what was actually made in Iowa City for sure. And that brought around um, this book here, which was built, written by Miriam Ryder. And this is still, after researching today on the internet, everybody refers back to this book. And they, a group of interested people in Iowa City class, got together and they wrote this book with the shards, and also in here, this is, oh, back, I'm going the wrong way. So this is my first PowerPoint. <laughs> no, nope, I've lost it, yes. This is also, this, there was a fire at the original glass factory, I think in the 30s or 40s, and this is all that remained before that was torn down to make room for the gas station there mm. in, in Iowa City. But this is the original building that, that was a glove factory. And this was the building they acquired and turned into the glass factory in Iowa City. Mm. And there is an illustration of this building that says Iowa City Flint Glass Manufacturing, but after looking closer at it, it's not a picture, it's a drawing. Because after looking at it close today, we decided that it's just kind of a fantasy building on their ad advertisement from that era. And this is some of the original salesman sample drawings they're just really crude, hand-drawn pictures. Um, many of these are still at the Historical Society in Kyoto and at the Johnson County Historical Society. And there again, they made lamps. They're just very, very plain utilitarian items. And, and I'm just going to read you a few excerpts from this book written by Ryder and it says and this is from a, a resident in Iowa City I'm sure they're long passed away but in the 50s they were still able to talk to people that their relatives had actually worked at the glass factory in Iowa City and this is from uh, Mr. Robert W. Hall of Iowa City 
and it's his sister, Sylvia Hall Boone. And she reported that their father, Benjamin Hall, worked at the Iowa City Glass Factory. His job was to throw chemicals, minerals, into the mix at the proper time to purify the glass to remove the greenish color that it had in its natural state. Mr. Boone also was told of seeing long canes of colored glass that looked like stick candy. These, she said, were used to color the mix. Although no specimens of any color other than green have ever been found, except for their colored marbles. And this was another thing they did in Iowa City. And they made marbles. And this is a testament that Mr. Leeton came from a glass blowing factory originally, is that they were able to manufacture these swirl glass marbles in Iowa City, and I'll pass them around. At that time, which was, you know, very early, and for a plant that was op only open 15 months, that they were able to manufacture marbles, and then also, which is an amazing thing, and you can look in this book also, but they manufactured glass canes. And these canes were walking sticks of beautiful swirled glass, um, comparable with what you would see in Italy. Um, they were just beautiful, and we don't know, nobody has ever said what they were used for. They were just a novelty or what. But um, to think that these were made in Iowa that early is, is really hard to believe. And these were also, they talk about that greenish color in the glass. That is also the reason that our Coke bottles were green colored glass. That was not a design thing. That just happened to be a cheap glass. And a lot, I have seen these glass canes. Um, last winter, there was one down at the antique mall that was just clear glass, but it was that Coke bottle green color. Yeah. And they are an, were an early Iowa product of the Iowa City glass manufacturing. Yeah. It, it canes. It's, it's. And then some other products. Uh, from the Iowa City Glass Manufacturing, and probably one of their best known is the Alhambra. And this is one, the pattern they found the most of when they excavated in Iowa City, was this pattern here. What is it, Scott? They call it Alhambra or teepee. And this has actually been part of the collection here at the museum uh, since 1971. And this was given to the museum by uh, Gary Eig, a glass collector and glass Is that authority. That's the design on the book, too. That's the design on the book, yes. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And they were also known for items, primarily, a lot of it for some reason had animals. Um, this is a children's plate. Of course, it was the Victorian, so this we were. Impressed. It's all very, what we'd consider not high quality glass. No, no, it's very crude. And even by other late 20th century glass companies, it was not good glass in Iowa. It, um, the sand did not have enough silica, it had too much lime. And that is probably one of the main reasons of failing here is they would have had to brought product from Indiana, the sand. And that's why probably the whole thing fizzled out. Um, but anyway, they did a lot of things that were etched with storks, um, little gnomes, uh, dogs. Just children's playthings. Um, this stuff primarily was. They also did a lot of uh, what they call bread trays, and we have a few over here, um, which were etched with different things on them. And uh, 
J.H. Leeton, he had a brother in Pennsylvania who was very well known engraver and were one, it, there's a lot of assumption, but you know, that he had some experience in decorating glass other than just, you know, pressing it. And for decorating glass in your first 14 months of business even in that time was, might have also um, led to the demise too because it wasn't especially useful items. And they're very limited in what they produced. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to read too some just some interesting things. This is uh, a lot of people would call this the Bible of early American pattern glass, and this is uh, by Alice uh, Metz. And it's interesting what she says about Iowa City glass here. Um, I need a drink here. Oh, it says, okay. It says here, the Elaine tray, which is Little Red Riding Hood, and that would be a bread tray. And it says, Elaine, the lily of Astolat, whose hopeless love for Sir Lancelot is one of the tales of the King, Knights of the Round Table. She was a maiden of least 16 summers. So I prefer the second title is it says the pictures of a child on a plate. <laughs> and that truly is, and, and, and I, she, I've heard people refer to her as the scary girl plate. <laughs> and um, here again, I think she's got something clutched under and she, she doesn't look very happy at all. But here it says, this plate is a product of the Iowa City Glass Company, which operated for only about a year in the early 1880s, but which products are eagerly sought by a certain group of collectors, many natives of the lovely corn state. <laughs> yeah. It says this plain plate comes with plain borders, uh, etched medallions, and on and on and on. But it also listed this plate as being worth Fifteen dollars, and I was told um, just last weekend that there was an Elaine plate at the Watch Here Flea Market. Um, uh, Tom Southard told me about this, and they wanted two hundred and seventy-five dollars for it with the chip. <laughs> and I think that's probably high too. But um, at one time, there was a lot of interest in collecting Iowa City glass. Um, in Iowa and in the Midwest, and it even made a lot of publishing, you know, people mentioned it in books. Nowadays, you know, um, if you Google it on the internet, I found a lot of it on patternglass.com. They have a lot of information in it all. A lot of it refers back to Miriam's book that was written in the 50s. And then this, I looked again, and this is another old Wallace Homestead price guide from, oh, probably the early, early 70s. But here again, it says, the Iowa City Glass Manufacturing, incorporated in April of 1880, uh, the Iowa City Factory general name. It's difficult to positively identify this glass as the workmanship is a bit on the crude side, <laughs> quite thick, many mold lines in evidence. But the uh, motifs include animal, birds, figures, combined with mottos such as be gentle, be true. Um, here again, they say the Elaine platter is worth $62. Um, so as you can see, <laughs> Elaine has jumped from 50 to 62 to 200 and some odd dollars. <laughs> um, there again, another interesting uh, little bit of information with the Iowa City Glass Company is this is a 1966 price guide to the Iowa City and Kyoto glassware and its values and products of Iowa's early glass makers. And this book was actually written by uh, the late Marshalltown resident um, John J.R. Cronin. And as to why he ever writ wrote this book, there's a lot of speculation, but he did. And I'll tell you a little more about John here. Um, 
he wrote this book in 1966 with antique publications here in Marshalltown. I think that must have been his own business. Um, he inflated the prices tremendously. Um, as far as the Kyoto section, which I found quite interesting, which he lists as the Sheridan pattern. And this pattern I have found no record of in Iowa City, Kyoto, <laughs> just about any glass manufacturer, but he made it into Kyoto. Um, and if you knew JR, this might have been for his own benefit. Um, <laughs> and I, I laid down a piece. JR later went on to manufacture his own glassware called Sleepy Eye. And this was a total forgery deal. He made tumblers, he made paperweights, and he made pickle bottles. And he would wrap them up in newspaper from Minnesota of the early 20th century. And he would send his children out to antique shows and they would sell these antique pattern glass sleepy eye things and they did it for many 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 years and my thing is I think he probably intended to manufacture Iowa City glass somewhere along the line <laughs> and I think probably the um, of course the sleepy eye thing failed and if it had taken off it probably would have just funded another big forgery scam he had going right here in Marshalltown, Iowa. <laughs> but he wrote a book on it, and he gives credit to everybody. And um, uh, Miriam read the names um, earlier today that he gave credit to here in town. And you might, you know, recognize some of them. Uh, Spell his last name. Uh, J.R. Cronin. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to see where he even put it here. He just signed the autograph to Helen, compliments of J.P. Cronin, C-R-O-N-I-N-I-N-A-N, Cronin. It's how are they spelling it here? Okay, that's it, that's it, yeah, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, his daughters are still here in town, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's just another little interesting history, uh, and then also, this is another pattern that was made by the Iowa City, and this is uh, Barberry, and this is also done in the little children's piece and another thing that and it's swirl they made a lot of things in swirl salt dips lamp bases um, all kinds of things but um, there again I think he listed this goblet I got a kick out of it as being very rare <laughs> um, and there yeah uh, yeah eighty five dollars yeah, this is a piece of his um, handiwork, and this is the Sleepy Eye pickle jar. And you can look at it, it's nicely patented with a fake patent date and a nice old Pontel mark. This stuff was all made in the early 70s. In Marshall. Yeah, right. He had it done, I think, so he had it made somewhere else, but yeah, right here in town. And he sold it here. Is there a sleepy eye on it, or what? On the front, the Sleepy Eye Indian, and that was a, the, the, of the Sleepy Eye Milling and Flower Company, uh, Sleepy Eye Minnesota. And that was, yeah, his thinking, yeah. Of course, that's a fantasy item. Was that pottery, Oh, of course. Yeah, they never did glassware, ever. <laughs> <laughs> they, these, turn, these turn up at Fred Van Meters and still to this day bring 20 to $50. Really? Didn't anybody but, ever check it? Uh, 
it was just amazing. It was amazing that he was able to do that. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He he passed away about six years ago. Here, he was at the veterans home. Yeah, we bought that from his daughter. Dan bought that from his daughter. She still has them down on yeah West Boone. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And um, yeah, um, another little bit is that the glass factory failed is a lot of workers he brought out from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and it said that they were plants from competing glass, competing glass companies so that he would fail. And I guess after the glass factory would close, they would go downtown and drink and they would, you know, be in jail and barroom fights. And, you know, 1880 in Iowa City, um, this was, I guess, quite the deal. And the, the, he had, you know, these other investors and they frowned upon this. And so a lot of the, the people of power in Iowa City did not care if the glass factory made it or failed. And that's pretty much the demise of what happened. To the, it was only open for 15 months. And at that time, there was a lot of extra glass and the creditors divided it up. They said they gave it away. Um, there's in the book, it talks of, you know, them using it for target practice and <laughs> everything under the sun. <laughs> but that was pretty much what happened. Are the candlesticks, No, these are just ours here. Oh, okay. with the, and, and there again, another thing, they called it Iowa City Flint Glass. It never reached the Flint glass, as a collector would know it, to be the high lead content. Um, these are actually early Flint glass. Here they have the ring. This is... <laughs> they called it Iowa City Flint glass. Our sand does not allow it. <laughs> Plain and simple. And you can just tell. It's a difference. This is Flint glass. Um, flint glass was never made any place west of Indiana, to my knowledge. And, and it was a very, it was, flint glass production happened way before the machine age of late Victorian pattern glasses we have in the cases here. That flint glass dates from the, you know, 1790s to 1850s, 1860s. And, it, and that lead content, what gives it the ring. It's, it's much heavier, and lots of times has a grayish, purpley blue cast to it. It will change in sunlight. Yeah, yeah and that's how you can tell it, it age of glass. It lead glass, if you keep it in the light, it will, over time, turn purple. And you can actually speed it up in a tanning bed. <laughs> they do it quick. Mom had a guy at the mall that would change his glass to purple because it sold better. But that's also an easy way to date glass. You know, that's early glass when it's flint and it will turn like that. And you can see here, these are identical, but the actual color of the glass is different. Oh, it is. Yeah. They're both flint glass, though. One's probably been in the sun longer, I would say. This one, you know, the purple one. Uh, so feel free to come up here and look at anything. Any questions? Any other questions? Does modern um, lead glass change color like that? You can turn New Waterford really? purple in the sunlight. Really? Yeah. If it has lead, it will change color. Does it stay that color? Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Lots of old bottles out of the ground. You, you pull them out of the, you know, people that dig bottles and things, they have a purplish cast. They didn't all start out that way. Yeah, so. Yes. Um, these marbles um, were made with uh, canes of glass. And um, 
I think the glass guy in Ames, isn't he working with canes of glass now, that Mark blower? Guy. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the ribbon. Yeah. Okay. And that is, you have to start out with those ribbon canes and then you, you yep, you, um, then what do you, do? Tumble them? you cover them with coat of, of clear glass, and snip them, twist them, and they're done in an iron mold. And then machine-made marbles are done, the, the glass thing snips them off, and they fall down on these rolling rollers, and they, they're hot rollers, and they roll them, and then they production. But these were handmade marbles, just like you would form like a lead bullet in there. Oh, the marbles? Were they? <laughs> Yeah, Miriam has a marble. <laughs> Where they at? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, your table. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe that's new, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know what were these yeah, couple bucks, Dan. Yeah, we'll what were she selling these? It must have been a couple of bucks. It, it can have been five bucks. Yeah, not much. Because it seemed like we even bought some more. Yeah. Rid of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't sell them. We sold them as. Well, the thing is, is that people say, "Oh, this is a reproduction." No, it's actually it's a fantasy item. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of people want to have this just because this is it. They were done once. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah sleepy eye collectors, they don't care. They just want the example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see what kind of inheritance he left his children. <laughs> Boxes of jars. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You knew him. <laughs> so, okay. One thing. Well, if there's not any other questions, thank you all for coming tonight. Do these belong to the museum? They do now. They do now. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and we have some treats and coffee in here. Yeah. The Elaine. Yeah, you like, yeah, you want an Elaine, don't you? I, I, was, I said, oh, I'm going to have to see if I can find one of those. And he said they're really hard to find. They're really hard to find. Yeah. The I tried to get one last year at an estate sale, and somebody was got it before I got in the door, but I wanted to get it too. Oh. Yeah, and don't you think, isn't she kind of an odd-looking yeah. gal? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you want it. It's an Elaine play. <laughs> Yeah, they, they have, they actually have probably one of the nicest collections there at Kelowna. I mean, far better than what's at the State Historical Society. They only have a goblet and a couple other things. Really? Yeah. I think it's because the, the gentleman that, that was talking about it, actually this is personal collection. He just keeps it there. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to get. And I wasn't sure whether some of this was Iowa City, it just kind of looked, but then I, I found out that there one person, they were talking about that this little guy, the dog, who it's, you know, a lot of people made this, but there again, this banded etching was only done in Iowa City. And I thought, well, you know, it's a dog and I didn't pay much for it, but I knew that they'd made this. And there again, um, this, I think in one of the books that they say this is very rare and the example in the book was from the Huntington Museum, so I thought, well, 
That's pretty nice. <laughs> and, but there, there again, and this I tend to, in um, just another little thing, how you can, did I have another one of these? It might be in the other room, but I just noticed the difference in the bases on these. And they talked about Iowa City being much cruder and um, the, if you look at the top of this, this is really not very nicely done. It's in the seventh Yeah, well here you can see how this one probably came from, it's just all around better glass than this guy here. <laughs> and so I would say that this is probably is a real Iowa City or Kyoto, if so, this pattern. But it's kind of odd that John was able to come up with this and call it a pattern from Kyoto, and it's kind of a, a mystery where this did actually come from, and that it's not in every pattern glass book. Well, thank you all for coming in.